going to talk about the torment. And here the torment is a state of physical or mental suffering. And we're going to talk about it of the mental suffering. Two weeks from now, we're going to talk about the torture, and that's going to be the physical su suffering. And as a verb, to afflict with great, incessant, or repeated bodily or mental suffering. And, and boy, for those of us who have been traumatized, it's like that, that part of us afflicts with great, incessant, or repeated bodily and mental suffering. So tonight we're going to talk about the torment, and I don't need to share my screen anymore. I'll come back. And I'd like to talk about it in terms of immediate response and inter, uh, immediate and delayed response. And in those responses, I'd like to talk, and I'm only talking mental tonight. Two weeks from now, I'll talk about the physical impacts of these mental, because there's always a connection, right, between mental and physical, mind and body but I've separated them for these two episodes. And here we're going to break it down even further. We're going to talk about our immediate emotional reactions and our delayed emotional reactions. And then we're going to talk about our immediate cognitive reactions and then the delayed, and then our immediate existential reactions and then our delayed existential reactions. And existential is a term that's been around a while and sometimes I remember hearing it and not really understanding it or contextualizing it well. So for tonight's discussion, existential means to be grounded in existence or the experience of existence, right? So like somebody might say that the war in the Ukraine is existential to the Ukrainian people and potentially to the countries around them, that it's negatively existential, that it could have a very negative impact on their very existence or their experience of their existence. So let's jump right in with talk about the immediate emotional reaction to being traumatized. And as I do this, I want you to remember the word incessant. Those of us who have been traumatized will share openly that when you're heavily traumatized, there's no beginning, no middle or end. It's continuous. It's a, it's a repeating loop. It's on all the time. And I think to put it in perspective, our ability to have self-talk is somewhere in the magnitude of 4,000 words a minute. And some of the self-talk uh, is self-regulated. So I'm talking about me in the first person, I, and I'm fully associated. And some of it is disassociated or what might be called assisted negative self-talk where the internal dialogue is about you. So one voice in my head is referring to me as you. <laughs> so that's a dis dissociated perspective. But it also indicates for those of us who are NLP trained that there's a part of me in judgment of me. Right, like there's two parts of us. One of one of my parts is talking about me in the first person personal I, and another part of me is judging me or commenting on me using the word you. Right. So our immediate emotional reactions to a traumatizing event often start with numbness and detachment. People who experience a, a very traumatizing event will often feel numb and detached from reality. They can't reconnect in. When you talk to first responders or military personnel, that's the first thing they notice because they're very grounded in the moment. They're very experiential. When you're fighting a fire or, or when, when you're on patrol in Afghanistan or wherever the hell else we send soldiers, or in my world, when you're in the front seat of a helicopter, you know, my mission profile when I was in the military was to fly a 12,000 or 11,000 pound helicopter at 15, one five feet in formation with anywhere from four to 12 other helicopters. So if you weren't in the moment, fully experiential, you know, if I let my mind drift out of the helicopter and think about my mortgage, my children, my parents, my siblings, something else, it was catastrophic. So when people are traumatized in those roles and they can't, they feel numb and detachment, it becomes obvious really quickly. Another immediate emotional reaction, that's literally torture when you feel detached or tormented, you can't reattach. Intense anxiety or fear, intense anxiety or fear. 
And this is instantaneous. Soldiers who go out on patrol and, and are fairly anxious or excited to go on patrol or amped up to go on to patrol now have fear or anxiety about going outside the operating base. There's often an immediate emotional reaction of guilt, which could be survivor guilt. I survived and they didn't. Or in the case of my client that I just mentioned, guilt for what she did right? Even though the police said she was absolutely not at fault, there was no way she could have stopped in the, in the time distance that the pedestrian gave her. She still felt intense guilt for her car, her vehicle at being driven by her to have struck that person down. Now, the, a broken leg, but nothing more, right? There can also be intense anger, immediate emotional reaction. Now, anger can be appropriate and warranted, and anger can be inappropriate and unwarranted, right? Depending on the response to the stimuli. In this case, we're talking about an emotional reaction that is inappropriate anger, anger beyond what is appropriate to act in the moment. There can be intense sadness and helplessness. And remember I said one of the hallmark emotions or the three hallmark emotions of trauma are fear, terror, and helplessness. An intense feeling of dissociation where you are depersonalized and or you're feeling as if you're watching yourself. This, this is a, it could be an actual defense mechanism. We know in NLP that when we dissociate from a memory, the intensity of the memory goes down. And it also could be a coping mechanism, but it happens quickly. People who are traumatized, severely traumatized, often get disoriented. They're not making sense of their surroundings anymore. And I would suggest to you that in the definition of trauma being something that goes beyond your threshold for normal, once you're beyond your threshold for normal in a traumatic event where there's intense fear, terror, helplessness, and the loss of or potential loss of life, that, that shakes your reference points for normality such that disorientation sounds pretty um, predictable, like it should happen. A feeling of being out of control, traumatized people will tell you the emotions just come over them and their behavior, their reaction. There could be immediate feelings of denial and feelings of being just overwhelmed. And again, I would suggest that the feelings of overwhelmed, when we've gone beyond the threshold of normal, now we're into the, the area of abnormal and the amygdala gets involved and it's high, on high alert, it's going to be seeking information and data to that may be abnormal. It's going to be on high alert. You will become hyper aware and hyper vigilant. And, and as a person who, who is normally hyper aware but was hyper vigilant, it's exhausting. It, it's a gift in certain fields of uh, endeavor. I would suggest when I was in Somalia and Iraq, being hyper aware and hyper vigilant was a good thing. Um, but day-to-day -day life, no, it's horrible. One of the hallmarks of a, a person who is hyper-aware and hyper-vigilant, they ask a lot of why questions. You, you know, some of us have partners who are hyper-aware, hyper-vigilant, and they ask why questions. Why are the socks here? Why are the shoes there? Why, 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 why didn't you do this? Why didn't you that happen? It's, it's this constant stream of why. And you'll, you'll know that somebody's hyper-aware, hyper-vigilant when their partner expresses in their relationship, I feel like I have to walk on eggshells. And of course, hyper-awareness and hyper-vigilance aren't sole determinants of being traumatized, but they're certainly part of the package. Cognitive reactions, immediate cognitive reactions are difficulty in concentrating. People who have experienced a, an intensely traumatizing event immediately after have a difficulty in concentrating. There's an immediate rumination or racing thoughts, replaying of the traumatic event over and over and over again. As I mentioned earlier, this constant loop, no beginning, no end, no middle, just continuous going on. There can be an immediate distortion of time and space. 
People sometimes perceive the event as happening in slow motion, where a few seconds can be perceived as minutes. And imagine having experiencing something horrific that now drags on, that now seems to last so long. Another cognitive reaction are memory lapses, not being able to recall important aspects of the events that traumatize the person. This is common. Now in NLP and in the practice of timeline therapy, and those of you who've trained with Tara and I, you know we have a technique called the timeline scan that scans a person's timeline. And when I've trained rooms of licensed mental health care workers, including psychiatrists, they'll say, well, your technique won't work because my client doesn't have any memory. And I will suggest to them always that, well, let's do the technique and see what happens afterwards. And inevitably, um, the person after we finish doing the trauma intervention will have absolute access to the memory in great detail with great congruence and when they recall the memory after we've cleared or released the trauma, they will recall the traumatic event without abnormal negative emotional arousal. And that's one of the confirmations that they're no longer triggered by and that they've actually released the trauma. And again, because you, those of you who studied NLP with me or others, you'll know that we believe that the unconscious mind represses the memory to protect the person until there's a moment to actually release or heal the trauma. Interestingly, there is a body of information emerging about the, the purpose of sleep, why we sleep. And the leading researchers on sleep now say that REM sleep is critical to disentangle negative emotional states from events and, and normal events. Traumatizing events, our amygdala does not seem to want to let that go, right? I mentioned that earlier. So normally, if you had a negative event in your life that was not traumatizing, as you sleep, your REM, during REM sleep, your mind would disentangle the negative emotions. When you woke up the next morning, you would be in a better place. And if you did it several nights in a row, you got, you know, seven, eight hours sleep, and you had a, a healthy uh, amount of REM sleep, you would disentangle the negative emotions from the event. With trauma, we don't find that. And in fact, we have nightmares when people wake up right in the middle of their REM. Right? And then strong identification with victims. That's an immediate cognitive impairment. Stronger than you would have uh, before it happened. So people who witness things happening to others that they're helpless to intervene often have very, very strong identification with the victims to the point where it's as if the traumatizing event happened to them. And MIT did a study that some people's emotional arousal, having witnessed something happen to another person, is higher than if that had happened to them. They've done surveys on that, and that was striking. And then there's the existential reactions. Again, ex existential means you know, grounded in existence or our experience of existence. And so people, people who have been traumatized may have a loss of their own self-efficacy immediately, their meaning in the world. They may start to despair about humanity, especially like in the context where I worked. 9-11 changed my life. 9-11 happened, and two years later, I left my company. I did my master's degree and went and started working humanitarian work. And my first uh, walkabout was in Iraq in 2004, as I mentioned. And then, you know, we were in Iraq because the U.S. government, Colin Powell specifically, had gone to the U.N. with evidence of weapons of mass destruction. And now we know on his deathbed, 
he he said his biggest regret was having lied to the UN and to the world about the weapons of mass destruction. So having been there, let, let's just presuppose that maybe some things that happened to me in Iraq may contribute to trauma. Well, having been there and had intentional things happen, I might start to despair about all of humanity. I don't, but it was a possibility. And I certainly see that in people who are heavily traumatized and then project or generalize that what happened to them is a, a widely, uh, not accepted, but a widely experienced thing. And then there can be a like a, just a, a disconnect with your life assumptions, right? Prior to being traumatized, we have a set of beliefs and values about our world, our assumptions, that maybe the world's a fair place, there's safety, there's opportunity, um, that there's connection, there's all these things. But then after we're traumatized, those life assumptions, those beliefs and values that create our foundation are just shaken desperately so you know the world becomes unfair it becomes unsafe there's no goodness you you can't predict right and and then we start projecting that out into the future and it may become conversations like this always again the word always or it uh, it can never another word about long term inevitability and so we start to see these words creep into people's language about negative aspects of society and it's really about a disruption of their their original assumptions about life their beliefs and values and they've been replaced by these very negative ones All right so those are the immediate uh pieces of the torment in emotional cognitive and existential sort of groupings let's talk about what happens in terms of delayed torment Long enough, and again, I, th I really think that the sleep deprivation caused by trauma is probably the root of everything else that comes after from the psychological or mental disorders, you know, anxiety, depression, PTSD. PTSD is a disorder disorder that comes 30 days after you've, you've witnessed a tragedy or longer. You cannot get diagnosed with PTSD within 30 days of the tragedy. That's So it is a disorder. Being traumatized is what happened to you. Having a disorder, you may be traumatized and never are diagnosable with PTSD. You do not have the PTSD diagnosis. You don't meet the criteria. You may have other diagnoses. You might have a depression. You may have ang massive anxiety, right? but you may not have PTSD. So some delayed emotional responses. Because you're sleep deprived, the next one will be no surprise. People get irritable or up to and including hostile. Now, as an ex-military guy, we like to talk about flash to bang. If you're talking about lightning storms, you could talk about flash to bang. If you see, if you hear the thunder and you see the flash simultaneously, that means the thunderstorm's right above you. And if you see the flash and then you count, and then you hear the thunder, every second that you count is some distance away from the storm. So people who are traumatized, their flash to bang is often instantaneous. So something happens, they encounter a stimulus, some, somebody says something to them, and they react instantaneous. Whereas people who are not traumatized will process the information, have a moment to have control, decide how they want to respond. People who are traumatized do not. Depression is, act is often a delayed emotional reaction. Of course, when you haven't slept for a while and you don't feel productive and you feel disconnected, I think moving into depression is pretty uh, predictable. Mood, mood swings and massive instability. High highs followed by low lows. High highs, low lows, and then the highs start to disappear and then there's just normal and deep lows. Anxiety. So, you know, Joe Dispenza's language would say we start to take the past and make it part of our present, and then we, we can't even connect to an abundant future. What we start doing is projecting negativity from our past into the future because 
when we bring our past emotions into this moment, it creates a chemistry. And then we think about our life coming up. We take that negative energy, negative chemistry, and we project it in the future, which is in fact um, anxiety, generalized anxiety, or even phobias about the future, including agoraphobia, predicting I don't want to go out amongst other people. And people become, you know, now that's a new boundary and they behave within that boundary. They retract into their homes. Uh, an intense fear of the trauma reoccurring. This is a challenge for first responders who are traumatized. And while opportunities are available to heal the trauma, once they're healed of the trauma, that means they have to go back doing the work that traumatized them. And they have this fear of being re-traumatized and they don't want to go back there. And to the best of my knowledge right now, there's not a very safe exit from first responders or military people who say, look, I love my career. I was traumatized, but I need to get a second career. I don't want to go back out on the street. And there's a stigma attached to putting up your hand and saying that. Uh, down the road, uh, sometime after, the, a delayed emotion might be grief and shame. Independent emotions, but grief and shame. My experience of clearing trauma with hundreds of people is that when we clear trauma, prior to clearing trauma, trauma often prevents people from grieving because the traumatic loop is running. They're in the other emotions. They never get a chance to truly grieve. When we clear trauma, and whether that happens organically or through an intervention with a clinician, there's often a grieving process that's required. And again, a delayed emotional reaction is the beginnings of feeling of fragility or vulnerability. And on the flip side of that, I have witnessed people, first responders and other people who wear uniforms and do ostensibly what's very dangerous work. When they start feeling fragile and vulnerable, there's a, often a compensation with aggression, assertion, um, a projection of that, that they're not vulnerable when inside they're actually feeling very vulnerable or very fragile. And, and here's the piece that, that leads to family chaos. One of the emotional reactions, a delayed reaction is an, you know, this growing emotional detachment from anything that requires an emotional investment. So it's, it becomes an emotional detachment from anything that requires emotional investment. So significant others, spouses, family members, friends, and a lot of traumatized people in this phase start losing their connections. And that is massively damaging. This is all in the realm of being tormented by the trauma. Then delayed cognitive reactions. Um, just constant intrusive memories or flashbacks. It doesn't matter where you are. You're driving in your car and you're back in the event. You're sitting watching TV. You're back in the event. Constant intrusive memories. A lot of reactivation of the memory, and it brings a complete cascade of the emotions because for these very, very intense memories, the unconscious mind has a hard time discerning between fantasy and reality, and it can feel like you're back in the event. Right? Uh, Self-blame is a cognitive reaction. The inability to make decisions. We see this uh, in police and firefighters and military personnel who, who mask the symptoms of trauma, but then over time, just their performance starts to degrade. So you have these high performance people who get through these intense training regimes and do very intense jobs. And then all of a sudden their ability to do the fundamentals starts degrading. Um, the, 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 the evolution or the, I don't want to call, I don't know, have a better word, the evolution or the beginning to think that certain behaviors like avoidance or drinking or recklessness, carelessness actually protects the person from future traumas. Right? This is an impairment of a delayed cognitive perform or um, reaction. 
the beginning to believe that memories and feelings from those memories are often are dangerous. So again, in my practice, my clients who come to me, come to me because the systems failed them. They've been through therapy. They may have been through residential programs that, you know, their trauma is normally not within the last 90 days. It's normally four or five years ago and a lifetime of trauma. They actually feel that memories are dangerous. They don't want to have any, any memories. And again, those of you who studied with me know that we use the internal hard drive. If you ask a traumatized person to do the internal hard drive before you clear their adverse childhood experience and before you clear their traumatizing events, they will not be able to complete the exercise. And then when we clear their adverse childhood experiences in step two and we release their traumas and all the limiting decisions about them in step three, and we give them the, the exercise of the internal hard drive, which reviews their life looking for joy and fulfillment, they're able to do it easily and effortlessly. And it is the beginning of rewiring their neurology using their neuroplasticity to start reconnecting pathways to positivity. That is the, the first step in getting balance in their universe between the positive experience, uh, negative experiences and positive experiences. Right? One of the next cognitive delayed reactions is a generalization of triggers. Uh, Dr. David Kessler in his book Capture talks about this, where there's a salient trigger, the main trigger. It might be a sight, it may be a sound, it may be whatever, but it's the trigger. And let's just imagine for a moment that a man with anger management issues, as an example, his trigger is bad drivers, in his words, bad drivers, drivers who don't know how to drive, right? So he's coming home from work and he's in traffic and he encounters a bad driver and he starts losing his stuff. By the time he comes home, he is elevated. He's full of uh, adrenaline. He's full, full of cortisol. He's revved up. His pulse is up. His blood pressure is up. And he pulls in the driveway and his kids' bikes are in the driveway. And those bikes now get connected to the trigger of bad drivers. Kids' bikes in the driveway. So he gets out of the car, he throws the bikes out of the way, pulls the car into the driveway, walks into the house and trips over kids' shoes. The sight of kids' shoes now can attach to the trigger of bad drivers and bikes in the driveway. And then he goes up to his wife and said, why are always the bikes in the driveway and why don't the kids put away their shoes? And she says something back to him like, why don't you relax or something? And he loses it. Now the sound of his wife's voice, the sight of his wife's voice gets connected to the trigger of bad drivers. And pretty soon his world, almost everything in his world is becomes a, a, an associated or a generalized trigger. And so for a person who experiences, um, you know, any sort of traumatizing event, they may start to, their triggers may start to spread out almost like um, tentacles, almost like a spider's web. And, and everything becomes lightly, moderately, or severely triggerable. Right? And then the last piece I'll discuss on cognitive, delayed cognitive impairment is the suicidal ideation or the beginning of suicidal thought. When you talk about all those things we just talked about, the mental anguish and all of that, sometimes the, the, the only outlet which seems reasonable is to start considering one's own demise. And, and of course, when that cycle starts happening, that's very dangerous. And, and then lastly, the delayed existential reactions. So this beginning in this torment, this mental anguish that people are going through, they start asking, why me? Why me? Why me? Why is this happening to me? Why does this always happen to me? Why does this never happen to anybody else? Those are called generalizations and universal quantifiers, right? Existentially, they start becoming very uh, delusioned, cynical, right? On the flip side, if they start getting through their, their trauma, they can actually get as a delayed existential reaction. Well, if I can get through this, I can get through anything, right? So, you know, when we get to 
T six or C T seven, the uh, triumphs over over trauma. We're going to discuss extensively the same sort of categories, but what's the flip side when we overcome trauma? What's the positive side of uh, emotional, cognitive, and existential? Because there's an amazing positive side when people can overcome trauma. Right? Um, again, people can lose their sense of purpose. So why me? Why am I here? What am I here for? And again, this is especially true when you lose your profession, your career, because you're traumatized. You know, imagine a police officer who serves 10 or 12 or 13 years, and then she's traumatized, ends up on short-term disability, then long-term disability, and then, you know, she's exited from her force, and now she's 40 or 45 and isn't working. There's an intense potential for a loss of purpose, uh, an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. And the way through all of this, and again, we'll discuss this in step five, six, and seven, treatments, tenacity, and triumphs, is to uh, first release the trauma and then start redefining meaning and importance in life and reworking life's assumptions to get back on track. So that was a high-level overview of the torment, the mental torment, the mental anguish that a person who's traumatized will go through. And again, it was in two big categories, immediate and delayed, and then three subcategories, emotional, cognitive, and existential. The, the key piece is any or all of that is literally mental anguish. It is mental torture. And the people, so many of them suffer in silence. For many professions, there's a stigma. Certainly I knew in 1990 when I wasn't right, that if I put up my hand and said I wasn't right, you know, in Hawaii, Hawaiian, they call it Pono. I, I wasn't Pono. Um, that I would never have an opportunity to fly a military her, aircraft again. That was my belief. And I believe I was accurate in 1990. Um, even today, though, when I talk to police officers one-on-one -on -one in private, the number one reason they don't put up their hand and say, I need help, is because of the stigma surrounding mental health. And so the anguish with knowing that you're not okay, and yet, you want to be okay, and yet you can't put up your hand and say, I'm not okay. That alone, that is torment. Right? And I'll just close. I'll share a, an anecdote from one of my clients. He was an Afghan veteran, and he's a police officer in a fairly large city here in, in Ontario, 700,000 people. And by the time he was 32, between his military service overlapping with his police service, he had 25 years service at 32 years old. And um, every time he turned on the lights of his police car, his blood pressure went up and his pulse went up. His chest almost exploded out of him at 32 years old. And the stigma of putting up his hand to get help was so high that he came to see me. And even though he had benefits through his police force that would have paid for it, he paid me with his credit card, he said, because I don't want it on my HR records that I had trauma. He said, I would rather just do it on the QT with you, Alan, get whole and go back to work and be a high performer. And true to form, um, we finished the trauma clearing and true to form, the trauma in Afghanistan's and the trauma in his police work were significant, but he had significant adverse childhood experiences that had to be healed as well. And healing the adverse childhood experiences contributed as greatly to his health as clearing the adult traumas. And I say that. And this young police officer, I, I really respect him. About 18 months later, he called me. He said, I'd like to come and see you again. And I said, what's up? He said, well, my wife's noticing that I'm behaving a bit differently. God bless her. And she said, go see Alan. And he came in and we did a 90 minute session. Because in the 18 months, in the intervening, he had witnessed or done some things that connected him to past events, and, and he was starting to replay them incessantly. And we, in a 90-minute session, we disconnected it all, and he's back at work happily. And then I'll stop right here. The woman I described who had the accident where she hit the pedestrian was not sleeping. Fortunately... She was referred to me by victim services. And I got to her within 30 days before that you would get a traditional diagnosis for PTSD. 
at that point, she now didn't want to drive. It was immediate and a delayed reaction cognitively. And she wasn't sleeping. And she was waking up at a specific time that if you know the sleep cycles, you will say that's when she should have been in REM. And um, I, I did a one and a half hour session with her. And we are just talking and moving as you do in NLP and hypnosis. And before I cleared the, the current trauma, I asked her to ask her unconscious mind, is there a trauma before this one, which when cleared now would give you more emotional benefit? And her unconscious mind answered yes, and immediately took us to the event, which we cleared. And when we cleared that, she did a childhood event. She Then we checked with the current event, the, the striking of the pedestrian. And her unconscious mind had resolved that. And we didn't have to clear it. And that night she went home and I, I and for four consecutive nights, I asked her, please text me in the morning when you wake up. And I did what we call the positive future model. So I took her out to 15 minutes past the successful sleeping through the night. Look back to now, notice what emotion you're feeling. She said, peaceful and calm. She went home, she slept through the night. And I got four consecutive nights of her texting me that she had slept through the night. Wait till you